Hello, everybody, and welcome to Wise Wild Women. And I'm your host, Jenna Care Lesson, with my co host, Teresa J. Morris. And our guest today is Johanna Gabrilowski. Okay, I'm going to read a little bit about our guest. Uh, I'm waiting for my co host to call in. And Johanna Gabrilowski is the best selling author of the book, The Transformation Promise. She's helped clients worldwide with life's major changes and transformations. From identifying long past incidents that can be the source of current major depression or health issues to dealing with career changes, finding and sustaining fulfilling relationships to the ultimate, truly ultimate transformation at the end of life. Um, she is the developer of the Quantum Heart Field Experience, is a clairvoyant medium, recognized metaphysical teacher, spiritual counselor, and energy worker. Her sessions are gifted, are spirit guided, I'm sorry. Her sessions are spirit guided and her client specific. She's a private practice and teaches seminars in the U.S. and Europe. So I've got to get her on. I've got to get my co-host on. So bear with me. I'm sorry. I'm a little bit uh, discombobulated. And um, hopefully TJ will be on soon. hope she's not having trouble getting on. I had screwed up earlier. And uh, now my phone's not working. Okay, hold on. So anyway, I hope everybody's out there having a good day. It is the next and last day of the new year. I mean, of the old year. And 2020 has been pretty horrendous for a lot of people. And some of them are not joining us in 2021. They have gone over to the other side. Okay, now here I've got a phone. I can call Joe Hanna. And one moment. I cannot um, type and talk at the same time. There, I did pretty good. Okay. Oh, there she is. Okay. Hi. Hi, Johanna. <laughs> it's Janet. Um, had a little screw up with the board, but thanks for getting on. So welcome back to the show. This is an episode of Wise Wild Women, and I'm waiting for Teresa J. Morris to come on. So how are you doing today? Good. How are you? Oh, we're doing pretty good here. And uh, we're I live in Maui, Hawaii, and Teresa is in Gulf Breeze, and what part of the world do you hail from? California. California. So, Which part, yeah. north or south or middle? Which Los, one? Los Angeles. Los I'm Angeles. in Los Angeles. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, my sister-in-law lives there, too. So you guys are locked down now or something? Um, yeah, like semi-lockdown. There's semi-lockdown, not of- like... Yeah, not like the first time around where everything was closed. We can still go to the beach and walk and stuff. Oh, that's good. That's good. So um, how about you tell our listeners about yourself, and I'm going to go see if I can get Teresa on. Um, she might be having trouble get in, getting into the show. So go ahead and tell our listeners, who are you? Uh, how did you get into this? Go back to your childhood and kind of tell us a little bit about what shaped you into being the person you are today. And I'll um, try to get TJ on. Okay, go ahead. Thanks. Okay. (laughs) Well, my name is Johanna Dobolowski, and I'm originally from Germany. I grew up in Germany in uh, a somewhat metaphysical family, and uh, my childhood was pretty much in nature. I um, lived way away from towns, and so it was a big time for questioning and trying to understand the world, so I started on this metaphysical path as a child, or I was born into it, and uh, as a teenager, I decided that I wanted to be like everybody else and not think about things. And I tried that for many years and came back to the metaphysical path as an adult because it would always show up again. I was always interested in healing. I have met incredible healers as a child, and I have seen miracles all, all the time. 
and so it fascinated me to see how how do miracles happen and what makes a miracle happen and why do some people get them and others don't and that sent me on a path to discover so what, what did you oh I think there is reason so what did you um when you asked that question why do some people get miracles and others don't what kind of response did you get either from yourself or higher self you know or higher guidance what 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 happens if some people don't get their miracles and other people do well i i think everybody gets their miracle of what they need first of all and everybody mm-hmm. has different needs and a different path so we often want something but that may not be the best thing for us or may not be what is supposed to happen to us to guide us to our ultimate home back to our spirit. So I think so it's things always like that happen. Yeah, you know, when so they're to paraphrase with what you. you're saying, it's for the highest good for the person. So if they didn't get what they're asking for, then that was not for their benefit. Right. And okay. It, you know, it's just a drama here. Yeah, it's really a good play or a good story that we live out. Mhm. And it needs it needs its duality. It needs its up and down. And um, a lot of times when we encounter well rough patches in our life story, that brings us back to our spirit. So you know, if it's really hard, it brings us to our knees. And yeah. Uh, Sometimes we need that. Yeah, life can be a humbling experience. <laughs> I've yeah. been there, yes. Uh, let me pause you right there in your story just for a moment to bring on T- Teresa to see if her mic is working. So hold on one second. Teresa J. Morris, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear us? Wow. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? I can. Yes. These southern people say ma'am all the time. Where I'm from the north, and it always catches me back. I go, where's the ma'am at? There's no ma'am in this house. Who is she calling oh, me? She's calling us ma'ams. <laughs> we don't do that in the north. <laughs> it's a, I don't know. It's just a southern thing, but it's military as well. We have to say yes, ma'am, no, sir, you know, yes, sir. But, uh, yes, it's a uh, proper upbringing, morals, and all that stuff. But hi, Joanna. Is it Johanna with an H or Joanna? Yeah. Johanna. With an H. Hi, Teresa. Some, <laughs> hi. I'm so glad to hear your voice. There's something about you that made me, like we talked to uh, one of the shows. I, I've lost track, but uh, I know that I do feel like I know you. And we discussed how interesting people's paths cross. So. Very interesting that our paths sort of cross for whatever reason, but uh, uh, there's another girl, uh, Suzanne may, Susan may come on. Uh, she called me a friend of Bruce's, but uh, I just thought I'd let Janet know in case she calls in from Florida. Oh, okay. I'll look but for she her. May, yeah, she looks lower Florida. But I told her it was women's show tonight, folks. So uh, Janet, Johanna, and me just uh, thought we'd – show up tonight and I don't even know what the topics are going to be but Johanna I've missed your voice just so you know me and Janet <laughs> talk every day y'all so, <laughs> so I missed your voice yeah, uh, I was well, having I'm Johanna tell us her story because this is a different audience than the one before um, okay. and so we were just starting at the uh, I guess uh, are you still in Germany in your in the story so far you haven't moved from Germany yet, or have you? Um, what brought you to the United States? You know, States? I skipped that part. I came here first uh, as a college exchange student, and then I went back to Germany, and then I moved here. But I started on the East Coast. Oh, okay. And now, then I also worked in the film business, so I moved to Los Angeles. What better place to be for that, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right. So and when you went to college, what were you studying? Got, yeah, I left it. Hmm? What were you studying in college? Uh, te- broadcasting, television, and radio production. Oh, wonderful! So we were when you went to Hollywood. Did you get a job there, and what were you doing? Yeah, I worked mostly on uh, PBS 
documentaries because that was a little bit more interesting for me. I love mm-hmm. the science learning. There's always something interesting to learn when you work on uh, science shows. So any uh, that we might know, what, what documentaries did you work on? Oh, I worked on the Space Age and the Astronomers. It was all a while back. <laughs> yeah, that would have been great. And, yeah, I worked on a few Novas. Yeah, I worked on some documentaries back in Pittsburgh, uh, and then I worked with the uh, George Romero's group. <laughs> they were doing all the the zombie films back in the '60s, '70s, and the '80s. So that was an interesting beginning. But I I moved on to other things. I don't really like monsters, <laughs> so I don't <laughs> like the horror genre. Some people do, but it wasn't my cup of tea. But I really enjoyed. Um, I don't know if this happened. For you, and now, Teresa, you've been in films or television, but when I saw the special effects going on, then later I couldn't enjoy, like for about a year or so, I couldn't watch a movie without seeing what's going on behind the scenes. It was like I was trapped in knowing, oh, that's how they do that, and that's how they do that. It kind of broke the illusion of Hollywood for me to see. Did you have have that phenomenon? Absolutely. Movies get totally boring because you notice every mistake. <laughs> and every, yeah, yeah. yeah, you go, you go like, oh, there's oh. the boom hanging down, <laughs> the, the mic's hanging down, and somebody didn't edit that, out, edit that out. Yeah. So did you get to do anything else? Did you do any editing or anything like that? I, I, um, I think the guy was trying to impress me, so he would bring me into the editing room. Here, you can come edit. I, I'm doing, and he would do it till midnight. I didn't say that late, but it's like um, fascinating. Um, make, those people can make or break a film. When yeah, they decide to choose yeah, I have great they, respect for editors. They they save my yeah. skin many times. <laughs> good, good. So what but year? No, I was on the camera. The, you were in the camera and oh, good. Yeah. Yeah, I was a camera assistant. But then, you know, I, I left because ultimately that was not the field I was supposed to be in. Mhm. So what happened? And, next? Uh, I mean it was pretty easy. I mean, you've been in the film business, so you know, I decided to have kids and the film business and children, unless you have a wife that takes care of the kids <laughs> doesn't really work mm-hmm. <laughs> because times are long. You have to go on location and stuff. So I quit to um, raise my kids and went back into the um, well healing field or I taught uh, psychic development and people how to be clairvoyant for years, intuition, When did you realize things. you were psychic? What happened that made you realize you were psychic? And how old were you? I, you know, I don't know. I think it's always sort of been there. But I truly enjoyed the 60s when everybody was doing drugs and they were all seeing weird things and I could just blend in. Yeah. Because <laughs> I really, yeah. <laughs> I thought um, I didn't want to be weird. I mean, as a kid, I definitely oh. didn't want to be weird. So yeah, I think sort of hide did. it. And then, mm-hmm. you know, when the, when this. 60s and 70s happening and everybody was just like hallucinating I'm like wow this is good <laughs> because nobody <laughs> thinks I'm weird that. anymore <laughs> well I used to I mean I still do I, I would have hauntings in my house and so I'd say to my girlfriends I wasn't allowed to have boyfriends over uh, I'd say well do you want to see a ghost and some of them would say yeah that'd be great uh, okay um, see if you can sleep over my house tonight and a lot of them did, not all of them, but a lot of them did. And one of my best friends, Patty, she said that um, she was able to have a conversation with the ghost. And she believed it was my, it was either my grandmother or my great grandmother, because they both died in the house where I grew up in. So, um, and I, I didn't get to meet either of them, so I didn't really know what they were like. So she, I was fascinated. Oh, and then one time we were, um, we were you know playing. We, we weren't quite teenagers yet, so we were playing with the idea of makeup and doing our hair and stuff like that. 
And I said, I'll be right back. I have to go to the bathroom. I came back in, and we had two of those pedestal lamps on. It was like a, a vanity, right, with the mirror, antique vanity with mirror and the little stool you sat on in the middle with you put your makeup and stuff and your perfumes. And then I came back up, and one of the um, pedestal lamps uh, was was laying down, split in half, like somebody had sawed it right in the middle. And she's just wow. sitting there with her mouth open. And um, so she witnessed something paranormal. I'm not sure what that was. I don't want the entity the one of us know. And then another one, we were getting out the Christmas decorations. So we're sitting on the floor. We spread out the lights. And we're trying to untangle them. And we heard, you can always hear when, when a ghost or somebody was walking down the hall because it was an old uh, house. It was from the 1840s. And it was built in the 1840s, and it creaked, you know. So we heard somebody creaking down the hall, and we, were, we turned around to look, and there was nobody there, but the, the floors kept creaking. And then this um, ghost walked through me, I felt it, and walked through her. It was like, and then we both had the reaction, one after the other. It was like, and we just got up and ran outside. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I don't that, like that so feeling at all. No, no, yeah. no. So, no, I used to be really terrified of hospitals. Because so what, ha- what encounters have you of... had with ghosts? Did, did you have encounters with ghosts? Um, um, no, no, not, not, not really not that much, except for in hospitals. I mean, just okay. seeing people in hospitals. Well, go, go ahead. Tell us one of your hospital stories. And then, TJ, if you have a ghost story, you're next. Okay. So what did you, what happened that was going on in the hospital that you saw a ghost? Well, I just, yeah, I felt that, you know, hospitals were really full of people. I mean, it felt like Grand Central Station at rush hour. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, any hospital. And so I tried to avoid them because I don't really uh, seek that communication. And I find okay. that very unpleasant when people walk through you. <laughs> It's so you've had that my happen. My favorite experience. Yeah. You've had them walk through you. Yeah, it's really weird. What did it feel like to you when it happened to you? I kind of like getting nauseous. Yeah, yeah. And and I had chills. It wasn't just so up I, my spine. It was like like the ch- like chills all like a. It's like a, a cold breeze would go over your skin. This went right through the body. <laughs> like, oh my god! And then it went yeah, right so through I my throat. Yeah, so I kind of worked on the same reaction. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I I try not to. I try not to have any ghost experiences. If I can help it. So, I'd what do you mean by you're a clairvoyant medium? <clears throat> Excuse me, medium. I thought medium mean that you pull in. Well, I'm. And you know, clairvoyant. Yeah, no, I don't like to do that. So I, um, I don't do that, and I don't channel beings through mm-hmm. me anymore. I mean, I've tried that, but that's not. I don't. I don't like that. I don't like. I don't want to share my body with anybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> so <laughs> very particular about that. No, I like to look at the energies around something or you know see i see whatever comes up so i'm like more looking at the energies and seeing what's happening and where you know you see connections of course to other beings Mm -hmm. if there are some but to me it's more important what's useful to the person right now so if i have a client that comes you know for a reading or something like that if I tell them that their grandmother is there and loves them, it's not that useful unless they're ended on a really bad note, in which case that will mm-hmm. show up. So that's not really the kind of thing that I like to do because they, they I refer them to other people that I really love doing that. And to me, it's more... Right. Um, looking at what is actually really useful to them right now in their energy and what can they do to change or clear it or add to it. So 
So do you have to be with somebody physically, or can you do this on the Internet? Uh, I only work over the phone. I only okay, work so over this the is phone, a phone because, session. Yeah, because if you... I mean, we're people and we're judgmental, even if we try not to ever be judgmental, we are still judgmental. And so if you see, if somebody calls me up and they see me and uh, they immediately see me as a human being with limited capacity, uh, capabilities, Mm -hmm. because that's what we do when we see a person, okay, looks just like me. So already there is a lower level of what they will accept because of that initial judgment. And from my mm-hmm. side too, you know, I see that person and I immediately have also not just my clairvoyant eyes on them, but also my mind eyes that says like, oh, this person looks such and such, which is the natural thing that we do. So when mm-hmm. you do work over the phone, you bypass that step of having to clear your mental judgments because you, they're not there. So you have to go with what comes yeah. through the spirit. So I okay, that. Let's, that makes sense. You make sense, yeah. So then when you're reading somebody through the phone, how does the information start coming to you? Is it, Who starts? Do you start? Do they start? Do you ask some questions to their voice, or how do you begin? You know, well, I usually start saying hello, you know, like on a normal phone conversation. Right. But then um, after that, I, I I ask them if they have any specific issues that they like to just put into the space. So if they have a specific uh-huh. question or something that they're working on, I allow that to be in that space. And then um, clear myself and whatever shows up. I tend to be more visual, so I see more pictures. Sometimes I hear things, but mostly things come to me in pictures. So how do you see pictures? Are are you like flashing through the universe and through time and space (laughs) and through the past? No, they just show up. They hmm? just show up. There's just a picture that'll show up. I um, I connect with their spirit and I ask their spirit for the information that's useful to them right now. And whatever shows up, I go with. So you'll get pictures. You know, my cat will come over and go, Nyeh, and she'll say, show me a picture. Like, I want to go see, you know, my husband. And I go, okay. And then I... I walk over and she goes to the door and she directs me like, this is the way, because there's three ways to get back. It's like, oh, no, no, you have to go this way. So it's like she sends pictures and I get them, right? So I never mm-hmm. thought you could do that, but, you know, an animal can send you pictures. Or that, and, and my two cats, they'll, they'll say if they want wet food or dry food or water, you know, they'll send me pictures. <laughs> I go, oh, okay. <laughs> so, you know, we've developed this. So I can imagine that's kind of what you get. You get pictures. And then yeah, once you I get mean, the pictures, depends. what do you say? I mean, either that a lot of times those pictures mean absolutely nothing to me, so then I'll just describe them to the person. Mm. And I have to say, a lot of times uh, it means more to them than I could possibly figure out from that picture. Um, or if I can, if the picture means something to me and I can interpret it right away, I will tell them what my my feeling is about that picture, what that says. Mm-hmm. But I do also think that the picture comes from them, so... If I really, well, if I really don't understand the picture, you know, of course, I tried to wipe that screen clear a few times, but sometimes uh-huh. it's very persistent and comes right back. Then I will just, and usually it's very surprising how meaningful it is to the, to the client. That's fascinating. So you'll go through but these I, pictures and then you'll get the story. Of, um, d- does that answer the questions most of the time that they pose or the issue? 
Yeah, it usually relates to the issue. And if I don't get anything, I'll tell them I don't get anything. And I, you know, can't do it because obviously either I'm not the right person for them or it's not the right time or I'm also and, able and what to about... say, you know, it's not like I'm, well, I have a client, I have to do this now. It's like if you go to the doctor and the doctor goes like, well, I can't help you today with that. I just don't know. So that happens too, mm-hmm. of course. Well, that's good. I mean, you know, when it's working, when it's not, yeah. Um, how do you, let's see, it says that you identify long past incidents, which can be the source of current major depression or health issues. How does that work? Well, then we go into the more healing work. So I coach people through doing healing works on themselves. Mm-hmm. And, well, when we're stuck, we're usually stuck because of something that happened in, in at some point, this life, some other life. Mm-hmm. Um, so you want to get to that to figure out what's, what's blocking that. So if somebody has an issue, you have to, you can maybe see like, okay, so there's a wall, but then you go like, well, where did that wall come from? And right. you, you follow it back or what needs to happen or I will ask, just pose the question, what has to happen for that wall to crumble? And I will, you know, whatever shows up then. And if, I guess for some people, um, those walls came from other incidences. Mm-hmm. You know, we get, I, I, do. I think there's three major areas in life that people would ask about. Either it's health or it's relationship or it's finances. Those are like the three major Mm -hmm. issues of life. And probably those three issues have been with us from day one and probably (laughs) from past lives. So, So I would say those are the main things that people ask about. It, it has something to do, and if somebody has carries like a big old um, wound about relationships, and now asks like, "I want to be in a relationship, and I don't know how why it's not working," something will probably show up that will guide back to what you know, what closed the doors, or what um, makes them repel the relationship that they seek. I want to bring on TJ. Do you want to um, bring a topic or ask Joanna Johanna questions? Um, oh, add okay. to the conversation. Yeah, I just tried to call Susan and ask her to come on. Told her another psychic was on. I think she'd really enjoy this show. Johanna, we have a lot of people out there with uh, you know a lot. Uh, I I wanted to get you back doing some readings with me, so we'll have to set that up after the first of the year. But uh, I really like that you trained people, and Janet asked me to uh, earlier to describe a ghost while you are talking. Now, I could see yes. uh, you were talking about hospitals, but I could see that I've seen people in the hospitals, but I've seen them here in my house, too, wondered if it was my daughter visiting again. But I've always been able to see shadows. And then once uh, in my house, I watched some people building a uh, it was like they were in another re- realm, and they were building a brick wall while I was uh, watching them, and uh, they were working. And I wondered, how could I see in this other dimension? And that was uh, when my kids were real little. So, uh, you know, but I, I really did And And uh, my kids remember grew up with me having tarot cards because I started reading everything I could get my hands on because I died and had out-of-body and near-death experiences. So. Do you think a lot of that ties in with uh, our have you trained people? Because I train people too, but it all seems to tie together in my mind's eye. But I'd like to know what you think about seeing, you know, not just dead people or their uh, ghosts. You don't like to work with them, but have you seen them in other around you or working? I I don't, I don't think I've ever asked anybody else to be honest. So, <laughs> well, <Johanna>. actually, the. <laughs> 
the last before I moved um, back to LA, I took care of some uh, friends in their last transition, and I moved briefly to another town, and I lived in this apartment, and that was what was going on the whole time. Like there, there was construction going on on that building <laughs> in another dimension. <laughs> Oh, really? Oh, my crazy. gosh. Are you serious? Who would ever no, think? I'm serious. What? And I didn't, I didn't really tell anybody about that. And, and people, oh, and people would come in through the windows and go out and talk about the walls and stuff. It was really bizarre. Oh, my God. Oh, we my got God. a similar story. And folks, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Are you serious? I mean, I've never, well, I've never talked to anybody else that just wonder if, other people could see because I didn't know how to describe it. I'd put my hand out, but it didn't. It was like watching, folks. It was like watching a sort of a dark TV screen that's there, but you know it's not there. It's like, huh? How's that work? You know. So I never did figure it out. But I was in my, I'll say my kids were little, so I was probably twenty five, twenty six. You know, that was amazing. Yeah, so what you do with me that, that was- part? Well, it was just a few years ago, and I didn't really tell anybody about that, but uh, some people came to visit me, and they spent the night, and the guy, uh, in the morning, he was all grumpy, and I said, well, did you not sleep well in my new place? (laughs) And um, he said, no, I was up all night. There was construction going on in this house, all over the place. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. (laughs) That is so weird. And he was like you know, young as a friend of my kids, and um, and I asked him. I said, "You really? You saw the construction?" <laughs> I thought only I could see the construction <laughs> because he was um, not. I mean, he did not describe himself as being anything in even interested in this. But wow. he said, "Yes, you know, he said I could see everything, but it didn't seem to." be this particular house. So I think they, the construction, that's how I felt too, was on a different house that must have been there before. Yeah. Oh, that, okay. Uh, so <laughs> That is interesting, but right here on the radio show, folks. But I guess it's okay that there's a high strangeness, we call it, or, you know, the phenomenology of topics that we may, we don't really plan, but sometimes you get with the right people and uh, – you know, just touch certain thoughts that come in, like that walking down the hallway. And I've been in a hospital and felt somebody walk through me. And I, and what's so funny is when you said, I, I was already telling Janet the answer in my in my brain when you said it makes you feel nauseous because that's exactly what happens. I got sort of, it's like you you're, you're going to get sick right before you throw up or something. It's this feeling, and it it's. It sort of disrupts your internal organs or your nervous system or all of the above. But it's when you know something's not right and it makes you sort of nauseous. But that's exactly the word. I was, I was in my brain, I was telling Janet when she asked you that question, how it make you feel. I'll say it makes you feel nauseous. And you said it. I went, oh, my God, we're on the same wavelength. <laughs> It's true. Yeah, and yeah. You know, and I did, you know, I had some, you know, personal messages that people had me deliver after they passed away. Um, but it always, I don't really like to do that because I yeah. don't know how they receive it, and I feel kind of strange. And uh, that so was I, in I the movie Ghost. Stay away from ghosts. Yeah, that was in the movie Ghost with Whippy Goldberg. But I think whoever wrote that script janet could look it up probably but that movie ghost oh, with uh, ghost. i knew patrick yeah, swayze personally yeah i knew him personally i never met whoopi goldberg but i did meet patrick swayze so when he got that part i was amazed because he was a dancer if you know who patrick swayze was but that's yeah, one of the all-time yeah, favorite movies i love the movie. sure. oh i, I yeah. cried like a baby <laughs> Aww. I really? actually yeah. I used to like references when I was teaching the clairvoyant. I said, you know, you just got to see this movie to just sort of open yourself up to some possibilities. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that it gives gives their mind sort of a model to think. Well, that the possibilities. And my brother loved. He, bless his heart, he's on the other side now. Nathaniel Burton Thurman Jr. But he favorite movie was Ghost, and I never got to sit down. 
and have a conversation like the three of us are doing now, on or off radio, mm-hmm. you know, live on air. I wish I had the folks, you know. So one thing I can say about, you know, us doing shows is uh, it's very opening to the heart and mind, soul and body and stuff like that, you know. And other people will hear us and not feel so bad if they've experienced because I feel better now knowing that other people can see other realms <laughs> <laughs> and talk about it live. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, Yeah, I kind of prefer a sort of higher, more inspirational realms than construction sites, I should tell you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there must have well, been a reason. Well, that is interesting. Did, did, you, um, did you investigate that any further? Did you see what the place was like that was there before? No, I, I just tried to establish some boundaries. Yeah. You know, I mm-hmm. just wanted my nights to sleep and be by myself and not lay in the middle of a construction <laughs> site. <laughs> so how did that happen? Did you did it work? Yeah. And so what do yeah, you do to establish what, boundaries? How do you do that? Well, if we're having bleed through from ghosts and other dimensions, how do you how do you establish boundaries? Tell them that I'm off limits. <laughs> Just like mm-hmm. that. They're like, okay, you know, I'm just, I'm off limits. Yeah, I had a problem when my neighbor, oh, he, he ended up um, crossing a river and he wrecked his car, flipped over, and he had two women in the car with him, and they both died. And so he kept coming to my house, sitting on, he would sit on the foot of the bed I'd get up to the bathroom. I always get up to the bathroom. And there's this person sitting on my husband's feet. <laughs> I'm, you know, two things are going on. Why is it my husband <laughs> going, get off my feet? And, and then who was it? And I, at first I would run away from it. And then I got brave one day and I, I walked over and it was my neighbor, Jim. I said, Jim, is that you? And then we were talking telepathically and he was explaining that um, he was in great pain because he felt guilty because he had these two women had died, and then he also felt guilty because he left behind his wife and two um, young young adolescent boys. And so he was just in a mess. It was like Beetlejuice, like his nose was falling off. And he he came for like two and a half years, and and I would get exhausted and I'd say, "Honey, how can I? I can't be doing this because I, you know, I have a full life that I'm living in. I'm not getting any sleep." <laughs> so he helped me. Um, set some boundaries, but occasionally he would still come. I didn't, I wasn't able to a hundred percent, you know, set a boundary, but it was much, uh, I guess he respected me and said, I'm not going to bother her too much, but he finally left. I could feel he left the house. His son was so depressed about his dad that he, he was drinking and driving on his motorcycle and he went right over some tours in Kihei and, and now he, right over the front of their car and, and then uh, it's like he went and got his dad, and they both went over to the other side. So in a way, I was very glad to be a part of that and helped him make it to, through to the other side. Somehow what I was doing helped, but I'm not 100% sure how it works. What about you too, Jay? You, have, you said your, your daughter might be. Tell us more about your daughter. Is she visiting no, you? She passed, but I, I kept – I don't know if it was a part of her lingering – are uh, there's two uh, mental pictures when I looked out my door because her room was right across from mine. So she went to the mm-hmm. bathroom a lot, right? It's just to the left. It's a mm-hmm. little small duplex apartment I live in. And uh, mm-hmm. it's, I would just see a dark shadow. And I was so used to seeing her go to the bathroom. So I thought, well, there was some lingering uh, thoughts in my head. And then uh Sometimes I would see a dark shadow come up, but when my dog barks too and sees the dark shadow, that was sort of interesting, but I didn't have the same feeling about my daughter. So it was a good feeling, but I don't know. Uh, You know, you don't know, folks. You know, there's knowing and believing, and then a lot of us have to make an assumption based on the best, you know, research or the best thoughts and logic we can, and I just always felt like, well, 
there's a part of her that still lingers here. And I've, I've, I've talked with Gina before about seeing people die and how different people split up different personalities or some, but I don't know. I'm, you know, we're, we're we're into a pretty deep well right now, Janet, and it's hard for me to talk about my daughter. It's still a little raw, but, you know, uh, I do believe in ghosts, <laughs> and I do <laughs> believe in spirits, and uh, Johanna, you know, uh, when you, we work as empaths, intuitives, these are things people want to know about for themselves, so they'll tune in, mm-hmm. and Johanna, uh, we had discussed doing a month ago, Wise Women, or two months ago, and you know, uh, Janet's going to put this on a special domain, our website or blog. She calls Wise Wild Women. So, Janet, back to you. What uh, Do you think that this is a wild part of us if we're talking about ghosts? <laughs> what? Well, <laughs> what we're, we're wild because we're talking about things that most people don't talk about. I mean, I guess there's a lot of people talking about ghosts and and uh, these things these days. But back when we were all children, it wasn't commonplace um also i couldn't get a demand that was you know just wise women because uh, those have all been taken so i was building a website around this which i haven't gotten to yet but that's the plan um okay well I'm gonna ask let's a ask question because uh, you, yeah, you, you, you you mentioned talking. that you were yeah i want to just go back to something you said okay so you mentioned um, that you saw people you saw people i'm talking to you teresa uh, you mentioned that you saw people leave their bodies when they died. Do you want to share that story? Cause I, I, I know you've shared it on the radio before. Um, and I, and I, I mean, saw my cat leave. I don't, oh, I've seen people die. Yeah, let's talk about the next round will be who did you see die and what did you see when you saw people die and who died? Okay, do you want to go first or do you want to go Johanna first? It doesn't matter. Uh Joanna, you got anything you want to talk about? Because I, I just, I was with my husband when he died you know, five years ago this month. And it's still like yesterday for me. But do you have anything, Joanna, or you want me to Well, wait, first? why don't you, you just started on that. Tell us about your husband. Okay, well, um, he had been dying for years. He worked for the President of the United States, and he did hip pocket orders in and out of country. So he had some men that uh, he killed or were killed or uh, wet works, you know. Uh, they have signed people to, you know, kill like a, I don't know, just important people that aren't cooperating with the world the way the intelligence community thinks it should be handled, right? So he had those kind of assignments. But uh, so he carried around a lot of dark energy with him. And so when he we're talking about when he finally passes, but he would see the people that he had killed or was with him that got killed. His mainly his best friend Jack Casabacus, Casa, that's a funny name. But uh, right at the end, Jack would come and sit with him before he died. So that's a ghost. And then so when Jen is talking about is seeing somebody pass at the last. Uh, it was really hard on me. I literally died the same day he did, but they revived me, and uh, our God revived me, I guess you could say. I, I was already the last rites, chaplain, all that. Uh, I was at the end of his bed when I passed, but they came. Uh, I fainted, but I was able to get pull myself back together, but I guess my heart wouldn't stay. So uh, I was going to get him something to drink. Uh, they had just put a hole in his lung and took a piece out of his lung to check the cancer, in his lung, but he had known he'd had it a year or two, but he said if he went in, he would die, which he did. He predicted he would die that day, and he did. But uh, there's some kind of energy he and I had between us through our navel, and we both drove trucks, and they would stretch. If we were in separate trucks, I could feel him about 2,500 miles, but there was a real energy, plasma energy between us. So when I think when he was ready to, he was in a lot of pain, but uh, he wanted something to drink. I went out to the hall to get it, and then I collapsed the second time. This time, because I was in a public hospital hallway, and in between the two hallways, you know, there, it had a in between where you get coffee and drinks. And I just spraddled out, one leg bent behind me, and one forward. And I guess the I guess the water, whatever I was getting for him, I forgot him soup or tea or 
something, the coffee, I don't know, whatever he wanted at the time, I, that slipped my mind. But I remember one lady coming up, and I, uh, I was dead, but I was sitting there, and they couldn't revive me. I could still see. I wasn't too, out of my body yet, so I could see everybody around me, and they did code blue and come yelling to get me and took me down to the ER. And uh, anyway, I was laying there, some doctors, and they came in and called it and all that, and then they all left me. And then I came back, and then so fortunately, somebody, maybe the chaplain came back, Some it seemed like, but the, they just said, wow, and I was back. She raised my hand, and it fell, but I had to go back up there, and they let me go back up there, and uh, that evening, I stayed with, they put him in ICU, and uh, he couldn't stay. I sort of had experience of coming and going, but my body container wasn't in such bad shape as his. He had already missed a leg and he had been, uh, we'd been taking care of him for a couple of years off and on in the homes uh, for him and he had already had uh, one night in November where he burned uh, himself and me and smoking in bed and oxygen took the house on fire. So it was a very long year and a half or two at the end uh, with him leaving his body, but he really wanted to go. So when he was in ICU laying in the bed, at the end, me and, you know, we'd call his sisters up and stuff to come on up because the doctor said, you know, he wanted to die and he didn't want to have that, what they do now with this COVID-19 run down your throat to breathe for you because it's very, I've had it done. It, it, uh, it's terrible. You don't it's, uh, <laughs> I don't recommend it to anybody, yeah. but yeah, yeah, that thing they breathe for you and they're, down your throat. They're, yeah, the respirator. Yeah, he didn't want yeah, that. Yeah, the respirator. So, and he had yeah, DNR, he didn't want right? Do not resuscitate. Do not resuscitate. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The, yeah, DNR. Wait, uh, you're still yeah. dead. How did you get alive again? Wait, you you, you kind of. Oh, when I, I'm, I'm stuck oh, back uh, where you I were just, dead. So, well, they left, <laughs> how did you get alive? They again? left me in the ER. Uh, I uh, talked to God. I don't know who puts you back in your body, but they didn't ever take me out. Uh, they left me there with. I call it fish eye, when you can see through your eye, but you're not out of body, because I do it a lot, but I had died, uh, I died a couple of times. Remember, Jan, I've died several times, but well, I call it fish eye, it's when you go behind your eye, but you don't go into your brain. I've been, as a little kid, I've been into my brain and got stuck there, I was hostage there. So I don't ever want to get stuck back in my brain tissue again, the consciousness of the intelligence. But I was fisheye, I mean, and I was, the cones, I dropped into my cones, but I could see out my lens, my eyes. So it's mm-hmm. like looking through your own TV. So I saw uh, the lady come back that was the chaplain, and uh, I said something, can I go now? And she went, oh, my God, she's alive. And she's alive. And so they called them back in, three or four guys at the end of the and I, I said, well, what happened to me? He said, I, I don't know. Uh, he said, well, I do know, but people don't usually come back and live to tell about it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, <laughs> you mean dying? I said, oh, yeah, I do that all the time. Don't worry about it. I said, well, i got to get back up, but I can hardly talk because usually if you, you go really without oxygen, it's hard to pump it back because it makes you real weak. Like if you've ever been close to fainting when you die, at least like on your own. Uh, but I don't know. I think it was the shock. They gave some fancy name. I'm sure it's in the hospital file if I want to look it up. But I, they so just Tom told hasn't me died all. yet. You died. Now, how long were, yeah, how long were you to, down uh, there? How long? Was, how much time uh, I were thought you it out was just a minute. I thought it was just a minute, but Tom said it was like four hours. So I thought it was just a oh, minute. Oh, so he's he, up there dying, and you're gone, and he's like, where is she? She can't yeah, die. Exactly. I'm dying. So, <laughs> yeah. So I then can, go I ahead. Can, You're back up there. Yeah, I heard I heard him, and I knew I had to get back. I told him, no, he's dying. I've got to get with him. He's dying. They said, who? I said, my husband. said, your husband's in the hospital? I said, yeah. You know, where y'all picked me up? I was getting him something to drink. Said, oh, my God. So they, got, they don't know what to do except verify. They said they went and had the uh, one of those secretary girls that punches in the computers, but she went to check. They said, sure enough, her husband's at blah, 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 blah. I didn't know the number, but they just asked his name. They said, yeah, he's on four or five or whatever, 519. 
So uh, they said, you feel, you, they, you shouldn't be, we should admit you. They want to admit me in the hospital, you know, do tests on me and stuff. I was like, no, no, no. You know, I've got to get up there. He's dying. My husband's leaving. You know, I've got to go up there. I, I do this all the time. Don't worry about me. So they were like, <laughs> they just look like at each other. Like, are you kidding me? Their her husband's really up there. So then they talked about it and figured uh, maybe she's just having a reaction because she knows her husband's dying was sort of the I don't know because I I was I wasn't really listening very good when you're like that you're hearing either gets really good or really bad I've noticed when I done this before but mine got really bad because. This usually it gets really good, you know, when you get really close to dying. But this time it got really bad because all I could my my conscious was with him. It's like a psychic. My my psychic soul was not all in my body. It was a lot upstairs with him. So I could feel him and hear him, and he was asking where I was. So they said, "Well, if you feel like it, you know, or whatever." But I just got up and went. I, they had to take out the. I think they'd run an IV or something, but uh, it was too late. But, you know, they they pulled that out. But they let me go back up. So I just walked back upstairs. I wonder not know if I wanted a wheelchair. And I was like, no. Nah. So I walked back up, and that's when we brought the nurses. Tell, you know, he was getting bad off by then. And I was saying, well, what are y'all doing? And he was, they gave him some fluid bags because, you know, he was a diabetic and they didn't know what was on it. He was saying, no, I don't, don't worry, first I'm dying, and don't, and I don't want this. And I said, well, you know, have you got anything you want to say or anything? He said, yeah, I didn't hit Cheney. And I was like, oh, okay. I said, why would you say that? He says, I just, I don't know, I was just mad at him, but I didn't really hit him. But, yeah, I did have a conversation with Reagan about Cheney, so I was like, okay. So that was all they did. And then he, they uh, they said, well, we got to get him somewhere like ICU. I said, well, where's that? They said, that's downstairs. So we put him, you know, gurney, the bed, you just click it up, and we rolled him downstairs. Yeah. And he says, you know I'm dying. I'm going to die. And, he, and I went, oh. He had a real bad pain because that hole in his lung had burst. We didn't know what was wrong with him. And they wouldn't. I said, can't you give him anything? The lady in ICU didn't have any orders or nothing. You know, usually when you're really in pain and you need something, there's nobody to give it to you. So. His doctor wasn't there. It was around six. He'd already gone for the day. But uh, somehow I got so I went He's outside. dying and they're not giving him any pain meds. Uh-uh. So it's like tough, tough to you should DNR. be you're on your own. You're going to die in pain. You're going <laughs> to die on your own. Horrible. Yeah. Yeah, it's terrible oh. with the DNR because do not resuscitate. Same thing with Gigi. But uh, so it's just laying there. And so at the end, when I see him get up, I mean, he's. The doctor came in and they said that we got one more procedure we can cut and put in through his leg, but this will be the last attempt. And uh, he asked me about it. I said it's up to him. And I said, Tom, I don't know if, if it'll keep you here or not, but you want to try it? And he he said, Well, huh, not really, but he agreed. It's because they told him, Well. It may bring you back around. So they put a cut mm-hmm. in his right leg, and, and where the thin part is between your leg and your upper, you know, they go in right there at the crease where you're, you know what I'm talking about, right? Where your mm-hmm. legs are skinny. Yeah, so the groin. And so they put some mm-hmm. medicine in him, and it, and it pushed his heart up. He sat up straight up in the bed, and he said, I'm, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And then he collapsed, he went back with his eyes open, and he t- looked over at me and my eyes and then uh, grabbed his hand. And the doctor said, he's dying, he's dying. And the nurses were g- going to grab the resuscitation. They were yelling, and two other nurses yelled, no, he doesn't, he doesn't want that. He wants to die. He's got a DNI. I remember upstairs, and one nurse looked at me and my eyes and gritted her teeth because she knew he wanted to die because she had known him from being in there a few times. And he wanted to die. He'd wanted to die before. He wanted to leave this planet. And I'd made a pact with him, you know, the 20 years, and he could leave. That's what he came back to the planet for. That's a whole other show, in it, Janet? But anyway, I looked at him, yeah. and he split up. He, part of him became a baby, Johanna. And he looked at me like a baby, a brand-new And he had his little fist up around his mouth. And so I knew then a part of him went over to the nursery to be reborn. And then a part of him 
was looking up in the corner. So these were different faces, folks, of our personalities. So one looked up in the corner and smiled, and that's when his sisters needed to know, you know, he'd be okay with heaven. But he's, they think he saw his mother because he smiled and he looked really happy. And then another part of him got up and the darker shadow got up and walked out the window. Part of him and his sister was standing over there at one time, but she wasn't uh-huh. there now. But he walked right where she had been standing, which I thought I remember. I thought, damn, was that Faye? And I looked again. I was like, no, Faye's not standing there because she'd run out mm-hmm. because he was dying and ran everybody out. So I went, well, who was that? So it was him. <laughs> Janet Richard Knight's calling right now. <laughs> then, no, I'm on the phone. Um, anyway, and so, so let's we'll see. That's so three. Answer. So one was one was looking up, which we know a lot of people can see if you see somebody die. Yeah, they look up at the corner you know. and they smile. Mm-hmm. And then some people have said they wondered if they were reborn and go to babies. And I saw him turn to a baby, so I believe part of him was reborn. Then a part of him walked out the window, the, the shadow part. Then there's two other parts left. One was his higher self. And I think goes straight up like a white ghost. I don't know what you call that. And the other part was his ET self. And his little body at the very end sort of shrunk. You know how the the life force, the water, goes out. And he looked like a little tiny grape being, like a little gray oh. being with the eyes sort of sunk in and dark and the little skull. Mm-hmm. And he had his hair shaved off. So he looked like a little gray human, you know, which we had talked about, mm-hmm. that the ones we saw. We're just humans. They look like little thin Japanese or people from you see over in Hitler's time, all those people in those you yeah. know, places where Maybe they were starving to death. Yeah. So those that's so, the sort of the five faces of Tom. But it could wow. be anybody. Right? But let me ask you one question about the baby part. Um uh-huh. so you got the impression he went to the nursery and was born. Um, did you ever look up who was born that day? I wanted to right. so bad that night. I wanted to so bad. And so part of me being a curious investigator, humanoid person, really wanted to go. But see, it was already late. It was real. By this time, it was 11, you know, 12 at night, and the nursery was closed. I even asked about it. They said, oh, no, the nursery's closed because they pull the curtains and stuff, you know. But uh I mean, I did. I mentioned it one of the nurses. Uh, I, I, said, I swear, I think, you think he could have been reborn? They said, it's possible. But I said, I, can I go with him? And they said, well, it's closed, honey, you know, because my husband just died, you know. But I know I, I did. I, I really did invest. You know, in my mind, I thought, that's I can't leave him right now, but I had to clean him up. You know, I had to wash. Well, I didn't have to, but they asked me, are they allowed me to? And they told, when they came to pick him up, they told whoever, his sisters and stuff. Oh, no, she's already – I stayed with him another two and a half hours talking to him, but, you know, and cleaning him up, you know, wiping him down mm-hmm. and getting him ready for burial and all that. So, And then they came and got him and stuck him in a freezer for a week, and then they buried him on December 7th. So he died on December 2nd. They buried his body uh, on December 7th. Yeah, and uh, the year before that, Johanna, I'll never forget this. I still have nightmares about it, and I have a – uh, YouTube I play. He asked me not to play it. Uh, it made him sad. It was music. And it was about uh, let the sea king die. And it was December 7th on D-Day. And he was sitting in his wheelchair at the table in the kitchen. It was dark. And I was in my, my bedroom in the back and the bathroom was across. But I looked at, you know, at him and he's so sad. So I said, honey, what are you thinking about? You look so sad. He was just, wouldn't say nothing. I said, is there anything I can do? And he shook his head no. His head was bent. That was a year before we buried him. But every December 7th, he'd get what really, really sad. Really, what, what, what I think he knew he was going to die. Well, that's when oh, we buried him. That's on also seven. Pearl Harbor Day. Pearl Harbor right, Day. Right, I think yeah. he, he had past lives in Pearl Harbor, but he didn't believe in all that stuff like I do or talk about with you ladies. He he wasn't, mm-hmm. you know, he could he could read people. He was a good psychic, and he used playing cards. But he could do it, and he knew he could do it, and he was real good at because he was, you know, had a lot of experience uh, <laughs> reading people. But he didn't do it like 
say he was a psychic. Well, let's let's okay. take that question back to Johanna. Um, yeah, Johanna, let's hear your story. You, <laughs> yeah, do you have any stories to convey to us? Well, I've been with one person when they actually um, left their body, and um, so it was a little bit of going back and forth. I mean, I I thought she was done for a while because she'd stop breathing and then start again and then stop and then start again. But, you know, this being the first person I was actually with. But then uh, when she did leave her body, it was... uh, there was no mistake about it because the the entire room filled with this gigantic energy and uh, everybody else that was in the room could barely breathe. And what some other people described, um, this one other person that was there was like getting an injection of something <laughs> into your body because they were vibrating so that you could see it. And then... Um, that just sort of dissipated out the door. But I sat with somebody till um shortly before he died and he would um he wouldn't talk anymore and he was very um very, very skinny, just bones and skins and to me like anatomically that was really almost interesting looking to where you could really see the, the the bones, what they look like if there's no more muscles around it. And um, and I would sit with him and try to communicate psychically with him as to what he would like in terms of music or anything. And I, when I met him already, he wasn't talking to people anymore. So I didn't expect him to talk. And um so he would sit and he would turn to me and grab my hand. And then all of a sudden he would let go of my hand. He would turn around and he would speak to the other side of the room. And I know there were people there already waiting for him. Mm-hmm. And then he turned around and he was unable to speak again and he would grab my hand again. So this went on for a few hours and then I had to leave. And after I got home, I went to bed, and then I woke up, and I saw him, uh, well, in my vision, get out of his bed and walk down this corridor in the hospital. And you know how the hospital gowns have that open slit in the back? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so through that slit, I could see it. as he got out of bed, it was just that really very skinny person. And um, as he was walking down the hallway, his body filled in again to be, you know, like 30 years old and in complete health. And he just walked out the door. And then a moment later, they, um, the nurse called me and said that he had just died. And I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> so That's all I'm leaving. <laughs> I had the same experience with my dad. I wasn't there personally, but um, he stopped by on his way to say <laughs> goodbye. And then um, w- within minutes, uh, his wife called me and I said, yeah, I know. He came by and said goodbye. So it was all, I mean, everything was kind of a, a nice, nice experience. I haven't had any bad experiences. As a child, I was close with my grandmother and if I was home alone uh, I got really scared and I would call her and phone calls at that time long distance were not cheap but I figured my Mm -hmm. parents deserved that phone bill for leaving me home alone at night (laughs) (laughs) so I would I would call her up and we would talk and she would talk to me until I fell asleep and then when she was dying she was in the hospital and I went to see her And there was a moment that we were alone and I said to her, I said, I I don't think this is okay. You know, you can't be dying because what am I going to do if they leave me home alone? (laughs) So, of course, I wasn't that concerned about her. I was concerned about what am I going to do? Which is (laughs) mostly what we do when we lose somebody. We're wondering like, hey, you're leaving this hole for me here. (laughs) And she just looked at me and said, ah, you know, she said, 
that's no problem at all. She said, if I don't have this body, I can just come by. We don't even need the telephone. So you just call Mm. me and I'll be right there. And she died a few hours later. And it took a while, like six months or so, and there was the situation again where I was home alone and I was scared. And I sat, you know, on my bed and I said, you promised. You know, you promised Mm. to be here. (laughs) Because I'm here now and I'm scared. And immediately felt like I was in this warm cloud and I wasn't afraid anymore. And I just fell asleep, like, immediately. So I carried that with me that I knew, you know, there was no real separation. And the way she described it was that it was going to be so much easier to be comforted in anything if you don't Can have I the body to, to drag. Yeah. Can I add to that? Sure. Jan, uh, because yeah, go I, ahead, feel like it goes, I feel like it goes with what Johanna said. My grandma died. I was in the Navy, and I loved her so much. And she lost her leg to diabetes. That's when I knew when my husband, I started crying when he showed me his toenail. I knew he was going to die. So I had a precognition knowing he was going to die, and he didn't understand. But it was because my grandmother had died for the same reason with her leg cut off and diabetes. They both had diabetes, both got their leg cut off. But my grandmother, the night she died, uh, I hadn't talked to her because I'd been uh, in Great Lakes doing my uh, military service and then went to Hawaii. And we uh, stayed in on the uh, Holikoa Hotel and then we finally got our place. And I remember sitting up in my bed with my husband at the time. He was a master chief. But uh, I woke up, and I said, I've got to call my grandma. And he's like, at this time of night, are you crazy? I said, well, it's not that late. I think it was like 940 over. How the heck could it be? It was really late. It was, But it was really late in Monroe, Louisiana, where my grandmother was dying. She was having a heart attack, but she came and told me. And... uh, We hadn't talked for years, okay, and uh, she'd raised me and talked to me just like yours and always made me feel comfortable. Plus, she was everything to me, and so I don't know why, I guess, getting caught up in the military in Hawaii and long distance and different hours and just being irresponsible, you know, 33, and I'd already had kids, but they were coming back and forth. I think one or two was with me and one or two was with her dad, but... That night, she called. I called, and the lady answered the phone in the room with her, her roommate, and she said, who is this? I said, this is Jan. Can, is my grandmother there, Esther Bolton? She said, oh, my God. Oh, Jan, I know all about you. Oh, my God, what made you call now? And I said, I, my, I felt my grandma talking to me. She want, wanted me to call her. And she says, oh, honey, they're uh, doing CPR on her right now in her bed, honey. She's just had a real bad heart attack. You can't talk to her right now, honey. And I was like, but why? And she talked to me a few minutes, and my grandma was gone. So I was talking to her roommate when my grandmother died, and I, I felt so bad because I hadn't got to say bye. But my grandma came to visit me, so... To tell me yeah. in Hawaii that she was leaving the earth, you know. So, but I knew that she'd always be with me too because she was able to contact me. Like you said, no telephone. So that's the grandma no telephone connection, Johanna, that people <laughs> need to know about, you know. So they're still here somewhere. <laughs> Janet, you got a grandma <laughs> telephone story? <laughs> well,. <laughs> Um, my my cousin in law, she was married to my cousin. I, I just loved her. Her name is Rosemary, and she died of cancer. And my sister calls and says, Rosemary just died of cancer. So I went in and uh, was talking through the bathroom door, and um, I said, Rosemary just died. And I have a cowbell, and it never never rings. And the cowbell rings. And then I said, uh, Rosemary, if that's you, do that again. So we had this dialogue, me, Rosemary, and the cowbell. And then um, I said, well, thank you for letting me know. 
uh, you know, have a pleasant journey. And it never, it didn't ring again. It, it never rings. I, I only throw in a hurricane. It's like one that really takes a lot of wind to, to move. So um, my mother came to my brother and turned the lights off and on. And he was walking down and the lights went off and on. He goes, oh, mom just died. And my sister came back to the room. She'd just gone down to the parking lot. She was going to go get some food. And they called her on her cell phone and said, come back. She's gone. And so she still had her mouth open. So a lot of people, when they die, they they leave through their mouth. So they go, ah, and they take off. So uh, as soon as she got to the doorway, she looked across the room, and there's my mother with her mouth open. And um, she hears my mom go, Louise, right in her ear. Her name's Louise. So I was sad. I go, oh, mom came to the bill and came to Louise, and I haven't seen mom. And my husband said, oh, they stick around for three days. She, it's not time yet. She's still around here. So on the third day, I'm, I'm in Hawaii, right, Mally? And her, my family house is in Pennsylvania. So she comes and gets me. And we zoom across to the house that I grew up in. Uh, my sister had closed it because it's an 1840s farmhouse, two-story farm, farmhouse, and it's pretty drafty. So when they were, you know, sick and dying, she got an apartment that she could keep warmer. So we're going through the house, and the house was haunted. I mean, when I was a child, they were just everywhere. They were moving furniture up in the attic and turning the lights on and off and standing at my bed and knocking on the door and uh, like my whole life was just haunted with it's like oh please enough so she said and there was a there was a um stairwell that was locked and a lot of the ghosts would go in the stairwell and and she would tell me you're not allowed to open that stairwell she was terrified of she knew what was in there right and she just said don't you open it so um, she said, feel it. Look, they're gone. I go, yeah, the house is empty. What did you do? She said, somehow I was holding them here. Now that I'm gone, they went too. So they all went over on the other side. She was the catalyst holding them. And so I, and then she said, well, you can't um, stay here long, this, you know, long because, you know, you're still living. And I just wanted to show you. So she grabbed me by the arm and we and we hurried down the stairs, and I think went faster than I could walk because it was my spirit form, and down the hallway, and she said, you have to go home, and she pushes me out the front door, and I go, shoot, all the way back to Melly, and I pop up in my bed, and I go, oh, wow. And I said, tell my husband, mom just came and got me, put me on a tour. So then the, the next, let's say that was in Christmas of 99, so in um, 2000, I I I was on a, a tour, so we went. We worked in New York, and then on the way to or from, I forget which one. I uh, said I went to meet my family and um, see the house I grew up in. So when we walked in the door, uh, my husband goes, "Wow, there's not there's no entities here." You know, he's very psychic too. So we, I took him back to the kitchen where the stairwell was, where all the entities were. Now the entire time when I was a child. Nobody could open the stairwell. And every time, once in a while, you would walk by, and there's a skeleton key sticking out. But my mother had yelled at me so much about, don't touch it. I never dared to do it. And I had a psyche come one day, a big, tall guy, like 6'5". And he, and I didn't tell him anything about the house, but he made a beeline for the stairwell. He goes, there's something in there. Uh, so that was, oh, that was the day Princess Diana died in 97, right? So he tried to open the door. And he said, nope, there's there's somebody on the other side. You could see a crack. It looked like you could open. He said, no, there's somebody on the other side. There's, they're holding it in. And there's nothing I can do. So then when I came back um, in 2000, and my sister wasn't living in the house. She just kept it, and it was closed up. Um, the door was wide open. I had never seen the door to the stairwell open in my entire life. And I went, oh, my God, what happened? So, yeah, when my mother left, somehow she was keeping that door closed. So, you know, life is a mystery. I, I, I can't begin to explain it, but 
that's what happened. And then my dad came to me too, same thing, three days after he died. And he was singing a song to me and playing guitar. So I, I was a, a little teenage hippie and I always sang guitar, sang and played guitar. And he never sang or played any instruments, but he was, he made this wonderful um, song that said, I'm on my way, I'm on my way. It was something like that. And he was like, whoa, Dad. And um, so I was, I was glad I got to see them. But I, I haven't seen them. They don't come to visit. Um, that's why I wondered if Tom came, because you were really close with Tom, if he's come to see you since then. Um, anyway, somebody else talk. Take the talking stick. Well, my 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 dad came to visit, <laughs> or let's say ahead, he yeah. invited me to visit him. Like, um, this was you know he died, and I'm not very good with dates and everything. So he had died a, a while ago, and um, I wasn't it wasn't on my mind. I was actually having a meeting at a cafe, and I started not feeling good and. I remember going to the bathroom and thinking like, well, I'm really not feeling good. And I tried to make it back to the table. And then I guess I passed out. But the next thing I know, I was seeing my dad. And um, he was just talking very fast. And (laughs) he told me that um, he had gotten certain things wrong, that he was wrong about some things. And but he said, you know, it's really wonderful. I'm having such a great time and everything is, I think in his mind, he was expecting that he had to, you know, suffer somewhat in hell for whatever his life was like. And uh, this was not, this place was not like it. It was all beautiful and he was having a great time and he was happy, happier than I had ever known him. And, um and he said, you know, make sure that you tell people that this is really a happy place and how happy I am. And so next thing I know, I'm opening my eyes and there's an ambulance there and oh, paramedics. And, and I'm like, my first thought, I mean, you know, you come back and you don't come back fully aware right away of the mm-hmm. first dimension. And the the elderly person that I had a meeting with was like, yeah, she needs to go to the hospital. She needs to go to the hospital. And and I couldn't say no, even though I wanted to, because I knew I was fine. So I'm in the ambulance and I'm thinking, I have no health insurance and this is going to cost a fortune. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> I need to get out of this ambulance somehow. <laughs> And um, so they put me, like, in the emergency room, and they started doing tests, and the doctor comes in with machines to do tests, and I said, hey, listen, you know, I have no health insurance, and you're not doing any of those tests unless you are paying for them, because I am not. And he's like, well, we have to do the tests. And I said, no, you don't. I can just, I just like to go. So I argued with the doctor a little bit, and he insisted, so we made a compromise on, you know, half the tests. And then uh, I I said I left, and I promised him that I would go see my doctor, which I didn't have a doctor. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I left, and I got home, and I thought, well, I had to remember this. And I picked up the phone, and I called my dad's wife, Um she was not, not my mom. And she picked up the phone and I just said hello and she burst into tears and she said, oh, it's so nice that you called. You were the only person that called me today and it's such a hard day for me. And I said, uh, yeah, um, why? And she said, well, today is the day your dad died a year ago. This is the anniversary of his death. And I'm like, oh, is that what it is? <laughs> well, I just went to see him, <laughs> and he wanted me to tell you that he is really happy and he's having a really good time, and uh, everything <laughs> is just fun. And um, so yeah. she she was really happy, and I told her the whole story. And she, even though that was weird to her, that story, she didn't quite believe it. She was so relieved by it that 
um, I mean, ultimately she took it and she decided to be happy about it. And then uh, after that phone call, I sat down in my chair and I had this really rather large bill in my hand from the hospital and the ambulance. Uh, Yeah, it's really astronomical. (laughs) And, yeah, and my dad, uh, the ambulance especially, and my dad had always said to us when we were kids and I went to boarding school and then college and he said, well, whenever you want to come visit me, I, I pay the way. And I sat down in my chair and I said, well, you know, I didn't really want to go visit you. <laughs> I think you made me come visit you. But this trip was really expensive. <laughs> I'd like you to take care of it. And I just sat in my meditation chair and I just told him, I said, you know, not really cool. I cannot, I don't want to pay this bill for having come to see you. And within five minutes, um, my phone rang and I answered it and it was somebody and I said oh yeah you know I just I have no insurance I just got this huge bill because I passed out in some cafe and she said oh no problem at all you just send it to this foundation and they pay for it and I just said well thanks dad for keeping your promise <laughs> <laughs> and it was all paid for I didn't have to pay anything so that was wow that's One year later, cool. visit visit of my <laughs> to my dad. <laughs> but I told well, him I said I appreciate. Yeah, but I said I appreciate a little bit gentler. I don't want to, you know, the whole was a little bit too much action <laughs> for me. <laughs> too so much again, drama. I told him boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can come by and just whisper in my ear or so, but it doesn't have to be a big production like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's do a time check here. Uh-oh. Uh, TJ, are you muted? Is that you, TJ? Did you, are you muted or did you mute it yourself? Uh oh, I don't know if I got TJ. I have to check her number. Okay, I'm gonna mute this until I find out if it's the right number. Okay, so what else would you like us to know about you, Johanna? What's important we, for uh, our listeners to know about you? Yeah, I know. Usually she has call-in people, or so she told me. Did, yeah, are they I, any or? No, nothing's working today. We barely got on air. We can call this. We can call this a day. I don't know what happened with Teresa. I think she just dropped off. Yeah, this is not Teresa. Somebody's listening to the show. Um, I can ask them if they have any questions. Yeah, why don't you? Okay. Area code seven eight six. Oh, hi, yes, Susan. Hi, Janet. Hi, Susan yeah. meets Johanna, and Johanna meets Susan. Oh, hi, nice. Johanna. I, so Teresa just dropped. If somebody can text her and see if she can come back on. Uh, maybe she's trying to call back in. But, um, Susan, have you been listening to the show for a while? I'm sorry, I had walked away from the board. Um, Do you have any comments, I, I or? I came in when um I don't know if that was TJ that was talking or somebody else. They were talking about their near death experience where they had to go into the ambulance. It was going to be a Johanna. big deal. And she, Johanna. Okay. Yeah. Um. That was very intriguing. I do have a few interesting ideas about what heaven really is, but I won't get into that. Um. Just like. You, you're psychic. Uh, have you had a lot of experiences with ET? Um, a little bit. Um, have you run across anybody who says that, or who claims, or who knows that they're going to be going home in their present physical body, present physical lifetime, and not have to die here to go home? Oh, home that's world. So frightening. <laughs> Sounds frightening for me. I'd like to leave the body behind personally. Um, no, I don't usually. Uh, yeah, 
really my field. Is that you working mostly with ET? Yes. In fact, well, I tell us more about like that. Down here. What? Tell us more about it. Well, basically, I'll make it very quick. It, the experience has started when I was like five years old. I started getting these past life dreams, like especially around seven years old, about my past life and how I died being obliterated by a black hole when we came into the Earth's solar system and upper atmosphere. And then I was born here. And then um, from there, they took me up in the ships and told me all about my background and my experiences and my origin and everything. And I was able to remember all my past lives. And the reason I came here, and, and I, I've been working with them ever since, having experiences. I got white tattoos on me, which are markers from them. Not scoop marks or anything, but actual white symbols. And so were you aware of you or why you came back? No, what had happened was in my past life when I entered into the Earth's solar system and then in the Earth's upper atmosphere, our ship was obliterated by a black hole. And then, and then, and then, that, of course, everybody died, right? That was in my immediate past life. And then I was born here. Yeah, but you said you were aware of your purpose of being here. Yeah, eventually. Well, I more or less knew that I had to um, work on the universe dimensional systems in its next stage of development, which I did. We finished it. Um, and then we had to stabilize other systems. We had, had to rescue other planets that were being conquered by negative ET forces. And then basically stuff like that and, and do a lot of geomancy and a lot of central Earth planetary energy work um, up there in the ships and stuff. And they said they had to make the best of it because I didn't have a, a, a body up there in suspended animation, so they had to incarnate me into a, a suitable fetus that would have the biomatrix that would match the soul matrix. And so that's what they did. And what it did was it accelerated my ascension quicker. Instead of me going through five or six stages of like the, to reach the golden light state of being, like w within a lifetime, I had to do it very quickly. Within like like my first few years of life, which is like teens and early twenties, and then and then after that, in the early, I mean, in my thirties and forties, I did a lot of scout missions, always remembering them as a form of a dream. I guess most experiencers do, where I, I, I woke a lot of people to their true identity and reconnected them to their star families, and then as a result, this new age and ascension movement is, and disclosures is a result of those people that are awake and working with their own kind. Mostly ET human and human and hybrids and ET human incarnates. Anyway, star seeds. Anyway, then we also did a lot of reconnaissance in like Area 51 and stuff. It, it's very detailed. Um, that, that's basically my story. I guess I, I, some people said I'm psychic. I don't know if I really am or not, but you, I try to use logic and reasoning, and, I, and I, I'm usually able to figure out something, and I usually end up being right, and everybody will argue with me, and I'll end up being right, and I go, ha-ha, I told you so. Um, I was, as far as my physical, my professional background down here, I have a degree in physics, a degree in electronics, a degree in mechanical maintenance certification in OSHA and HAZWOPER, and um, I have a DOE core level one certification. I, I worked in the nuclear industry from 1981 to 2008, and I went to the internship for FP&L um, from 2009 to 2011. And it was when I didn't get – I made straight A's, the dean's list and everything. It was when I didn't get hired back on at FT&M that I, I, was, I was spinning. And I decided, well, I must be – you know, I could have worked more than I did. And I think it's because of my connection up there that I'm not working as much as I should. On top of the fact that we're women, and I guess as women, we're, um, we're supposed to, like, perform in order to get certain positions instead of, like – the positions being based on our credibility and our merit and our accomplishments. It's based on something else, which is pretty pathetic, even to this day. I guess the basic question, if I was going to have a psychic question, it would be, um, is there any others on the, on this planet from my, my people on the planet's surface? Will I ever meet them? 
And when am I going home? Uh, am I going home? In, which I think I'm going home in my present physical form. So, Hannah, well, I think there's, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's lots of people um, like you scattered about. Will I ever meet them or probably not? Well, when you worked on, in, what did you say, in 81 on the nuclear project, where was that? From 1989 to 2011. Oh. Where, where was that? What state? Um, I, I started off at, at the home nuclear plant here in, in Florida for three years, yeah, three years and three months, and then there was a company-wide layoff. And then I worked at the Savannah River site for nine months at the, in the Savannah, you know, on the Savannah River there in um, Aiken, South Carolina, and then I worked – from there, when I came back here in 94, I started going on the road as a nuclear contractor. Hi. Um, okay, Teresa, you want to check over for a couple minutes? I'll be right back. You, you take, uh, take the house. Okay, yeah, I'll sure. be back in a few. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Hi, uh, Suzanne and uh, Johanna. Johanna, she's a very high level. I uh, don't know that we have a universal name for her uh, intelligence, and she's helping us in ontology for sure. But uh, what I saw universally as a psychic is she was working with people, uh, they were like, for me, she's one of the gatekeepers of one of the portals that we can, I don't know how to say it, because she has all this knowledge of black holes and I have a lot of universal knowledge, so uh, I work in a lot of universes and realms, like we were talking about seeing people, you know, in other realms. So you may can help us, Johanna, because she's looking for specific, uh, uh, hopefully, people similar with her level, but she's such a high-level energy and being plus super intelligent and nuclear down here. Uh, I really feel like uh, talking to Susan, and I've gotten uh, I've got the advantage because I've talked to her off uh, radio. But uh, Johanna, I sort of asked her to come on tonight to help us out. Uh, I see her, and she's working with some people that were on the other side of the sun in this reality. So Johanna, you and I haven't really had a chance to talk about my higher level, but I work in universal levels like she does. But in one of the in the Milky Way galaxy, I had seen her as one of the protectors of a what we call uh, and it used to be well they're called portals, but uh, you know this this would jump from ghost stories to realms to I don't know Johanna this is hard this may be the I don't know you know what I'm saying Susanna's uh, really high level intelligence with a lot of knowledge of uh, the universes. And the brains, and then the milk, the galaxies, and she works with a lot of people that talk different levels. Johanna, uh, do you have any way to do that type of psychic work yourself, Johanna? Because well, when what I see about when you said about meeting somebody, I just like I see you like work mostly in the south of the United States. You know, yeah, the, I, li- that I live that area. Like- and I'm, I see yeah, that I the, the the circle for you to be is actually along the Canadian border. And I have no idea why I see that as a, um, you know, flip side to it. But that was what, that's the first thing that I saw when I, um, when you asked about the connection with other people. Here. Well, to be to be specific, I come from our fact and I'm our fact the enemy universe, and I, I can tell you exactly how how I figured that out. I was actually told that by my elders from the our fact and I'm our fact the enemy universe, because I have a symbol on on, on a part of my body, okay, on an a, a extremity of my body. I have a symbol, and I for a long time I never knew what that symbol meant, and I got it back in '82. You know, when I was in Tully Trucks in New York, September 12, 1982, I remember it exactly. 
and I remember the scene and everything. There was a lot of UFO activity up there at that time. And the symbol, I didn't know what it meant, but it was a very clear symbol. It's a small letter F laying on its side Well, it, it, with a square underneath it with a hook on the square. Okay, well, anyway, I never knew what that meant. Well, back in 2015, I had a dream or a scene where the elders from Refactum and Refactum Universe were on, on a colony ship. And it was just outside of the, uh, the Aldebaran star system in Taurus. And and they specifically told me, they said, come here a minute. And there are three elders, and they're like six and a half to seven foot tall, but they're not the tall whites. And, they, and they're not the tall grays either. And they specifically told me, the symbol on your ankle means you're from Refactum and Refactum Universe. That's where you're from. That's your home universe. And that you're here to do dimensional work or something, which you've done. And they said, we'll, we'll tell you more about what the other symbols mean. But right now, there's a lot of chaos and confusion right now. So we'll meet you a later time. Well, they left. And the reason was because I was playing with these four-foot-tall dimensional – they're like – Chromogians or something like that, and they um they do a lot of dimensional work and they do dimensional hide and seek and tag and I and I play dimensional games with them, as it's a form of recreation that we do, and um I don't know for some reason they're very close to me and and they really enjoy my company and I'm supposed to be one of the head leaders up there in the several councils, but but we just because we're really high up there doesn't mean we isolate ourselves from the common population. We interact with them. We're very proactive in our missions and, and wars and stuff. We don't isolate ourselves in a cubicle like like, like the Washington, D.C. We're, we're very proactive in every project that we do, energetically wise, supplying force and everything else, meaning energy force to enhance the other fleets and stuff. Um, but anyway, later on, I was told what that symbol means. And then I and then I would look up a spiritual um group. There was like four spiritual signs on the spiritual website on YouTube, and I picked that symbol and it means warrior. And I've been told several times by several different people that don't even know each other that I'm a warrior, that I'm a light warrior and I do a lot of good. And then and then I and then um um. I think I'm the only one here for – anyway, we we came from our fact and our fact the anime universe through the fast track system and then empties out in the, to what, what they call the Orion Stargate system, which is behind – it opens up behind Orion's built, and it feeds off into like Taurus and Cassiopeia. I, I know my astronomy. Yeah. I used to study the constellations. That's how, how I can name it. And the other, other part of the portal opens up in uh, Booties, which is where that void is. And 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 also Hercules and Lyra and and especially Cygnus, which Alpha Draconis portal is. I was told it was there by a person named Deborah Hellman. So and anyway, we work all these dimensional systems. We set up fast track systems. We change navigational routes. Oh oh, oh and I fly any kind of ship that there is up there. Uh, it, it, our name and our language is called Zvari. S V A R E or S V A R I Zvari. And, and and it means navigator and loose terms and English. But it means it's the ability to fly any type of different type of ship because it's not really flight like you have it down here. It's like energy projection and harmonic resonance and a hyper yeah. coupling and, and everything like that. But it's hard to explain it. You change from a physical to, to energy and back into physical again using silicon and wave mechanics. Light harmonic resonances and hyper and projection or harmonic resonance projection. This is all I had to use particle physics terminology to describe what we're doing. Well, anyway, yeah, we came no, in I'm through, aware we, of some of those things. We we and I don't use them in the same context that particle physicists use either. My understanding Suzanne, of black you, holes and oh, I'm sorry, Susanna. Go ahead. That was a delay. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm back. I'm no. back. Do you need me? Tracy, yeah, you need me um, back. Yeah, if you don't mind. I was just uh, wanting to ask Susanna and Johanna a question because they're in a high level. Well, Susanna's, you know, her highest level or one of her high levels. But Johanna said she was familiar. So I was going to ask Johanna because I would really like, Janet, our help with this weekly show. 
of getting to talk in 2021, this higher level that a lot of people don't understand. Susanna is very good at articulating some of the stuff I know, but not all of it. And plus, she studied those constellations. But Johanna, were you going to tell Susanna, I thought I heard you say you were familiar with some parts of that. So this would be a really good time for us to uh, talk about you know, all the councils, because we don't all know each other. We're just meeting on the planet. Janet's met a few men, but we haven't really met too many women of you know, the highest universal, all the different universes coming together, Johanna. And I work at uh, seven universal levels, and I'm sort of trying to talk to Suzanne on at least a couple of them. And Janet's talked to, to me on at least on a couple of universal levels. But Johanna, could you tell us what you said you were familiar with, so we can see if it resonates well, with Suzanne. <laughs> no, but I, I mean, I have uh, dabbled in that, not to the level of Suzanne. I've, um, you know, read and studied uh, some some of those things, but it's not really, it, it did not, I mean, that is not my path. And, um, but I do understand it and I do know it exists and, um I understand yeah, what you're saying good. is what I was saying. <laughs> wow. But that's, well, good for I, you. Um, that's, that's what Suzanne needs. She needs somebody that at least can understand some of it because I try and Janet tries and Janet and I get an argument, but we're trying to understand. But, you know, it's <laughs> like a drop in the ocean. Each one of us is a drop, so I, a little drop, and we're trying to, but, you know, figure out how to talk to each other. So the, the thing that I, ahead, I was Johanna. saying, because obviously she's looking for um, people like her, Susanna. Am I getting that right? Yeah, Somebody I'm that you can relate to? People that claim that are from Cygnus and remembered her past lives in Cygnus or, or Taurus and what is now the Crab Nebula that used to be called Budutan before it went supernova. Yeah, I I think um, the the person that I would uh, recommend for you to get in contact with uh, is Lisa Renee. Do you know her? No. Um, she has a website, Energetic Synthesis. Um, but she does a lot of kind of work that you do, and um, I I think. You know, looking for people that are more like-minded, that might be a really good person to for you to get in touch with. Um, <laughs> Lisa Renee, I've heard that name. That resonates with me. Lisa I'll look it Renee, up. I'll look it up. Okay, thank you, Jane. Well, energetic synthesis. Energetic synthesis. Okay. I've heard of that because somebody else was you know, helping me at one time with ontology. Go ahead, I'll mute. Um, and also, Susan, when when uh, you guys were talking, I got a vision that when you start speaking at conferences, and you will be speaking, that people are going to come up and and they'll tell you about their connections too, and that's where you're going to meet your tribe. So what do I yeah. know? <laughs> but I, I saw a clear vision of you speaking and, and uh, people coming up and going, oh, you know, same with me. Because yours is not one of the common planets or species that people mention. So, but, it, you know, the theory is, is that lots of ambassadors and warriors and things are coming to the earth because we're going through this high transformational process like the ascension process and um, we're, we need a lot of help as you can see right now we've got lots of disease and wars and rumors of wars and craziness going on here so a lot of species are sending their ambassadors here to oversee the project and report back but just because nobody's you know reported on your part of the galaxy now, first of all, I haven't covered everything, so maybe I missed it. But secondly, um, you know, you could be the first one there, but you might find another one. They might have sent more. You made a request for for backup, so to speak, so maybe they've sent them. But if you keep putting it out there energetically and then you move 
actively in that direction by doing things, I think you'll eventually pull them in. Would, okay, who wants have, the talking stick? What, what, ha- what okay. happens if for some reason I decide not to do any more public anything? Am I still going to meet them, or, or is this the risk I have to take in order to be able to connect and meet them? Well, you could meet them at the grocery store for all I know. I mean, I'm not in control of your destiny, what your intentions are. But um, and I get what she, I think she means. Uh, yeah, she wants to be able to help uh, see it in her mind's eye, like psychics do. Suzanne, do you get your own visions when you are searching, or what are you? Uh, maybe we should discuss that with you. Is you know everybody has psychic abilities, and yours is not only taking everything you know, but you're doing your best to incorporate it here on the planet. And, you know, engineers and people uh, that need you to interpret what they don't know are the people that we need to somehow connect you with. And maybe that Lisa Renee, uh, and you're definitely an energy worker, but you can put the humanoid engineering nuclear terms to what they're well, see, doing. I, 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 I did that. I took introduction to engineering. I took electronic electronics engineering technology or electronics for short at, at, at the college. And they got an AS degree in it with a, a, with wow. a, a 2.65 GPA. I took Jeez. electronics at Robert Morgan and I, I had a 4.5 GPA. Um, I had a general 2.5 because all those liberal arts courses dragged down my grade point average. I had I had like a 2.5 in and in, um, physics, uh, and they wouldn't give me the physics degree with the title physics on it. That they, they were already, every step of the way. Not only did I have to earn it, I had to fight for it. Average people, they they can go to school, get their degree, go through the plan the program, and step by step, and they're guaranteed. Usually, they land a job or anything right at the end of the, when their graduation, me, not only did I have to go to school and earn it, I also had to fight for it and, and file lawsuits and everything when I was denied employment. It, it, it's just rough. I worked for the, a government agency, and again, they, they, they deliberately fired me because I was on the blacklist because of my connection up there. You know how the deep state is. And um, I, I was labeled and, and blocked, and, and I filed, a, and, and I was treated it was another government agency, so I couldn't get a job there anymore, and that took over to doing the background checks for the nuclear industry, and I got barred out of my other profession, which I loved very much, because it's dealing with energy. The higher the energy, the more intense, the more exhilarated and, and, and the euphoric adrenaline rush I get, and the more well, other I can people see you working. Me. What? Let's I could see you crossing over into our world uh, in the psychic spiritual world. I just, we're recreating it. So maybe you're supposed to be one of the creators. You know how you held the grid and then uh, you know a lot of things that we're doing psychically. Uh, Are you following Elon Musk that he believes that we're possibly in a, uh, it's like a video game? (laughs) Oh, um, so, that, well, that yeah. so that's where, where that stupid cornball theory came from. <laughs> yeah, well, that that is that is that is wild, See, maybe creation is, uh, you know, creation is a game. No matter what uh, solar system or galaxy we come from, I mean, we're still in creation. So I personally like to get out of the creation part. <laughs> um <laughs> and back into um, just into the heart field. But, you know, there is that whole field of creation that um, and science that is interesting and it has a large tribe and and there is, I'm sure, other people like you also here. I'm sure of that. And uh, I'm sure that you can find them too, but that's just the choice to make to to hold the grids. But um, that's really not not where I want to be or I'm going direction but 
there are plenty of people, and I know a lot of people that um, work in that field. But it's necessary, and uh, and I can tell you, I am a, a, from what I remember in my past life, and in, even in this life presently. I am a very highly evolved master energy creator being, which is why I'm on a very high position of counsel in the other universe. I'm not trying to brag. I'm not trying to be conceited or nothing. This is what I was told. This is what I was shown. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I'm. Yeah, I believe you, and I, I think that's, you know, perfect for you. To, no, uh, to do that. I know. And I'm glad there are people doing that kind of work, but I know but that's the point. Not, my kind of work. The, the point is, I can tell you firsthand from my experiences and the work I do up there, the universe creation and all of that is not a video game. It's not a holographic universe. It's not a, a, a recreation in our mind. It's not, not some damn video game or nothing. You take all that BS and throw it out the window because there's no such thing. I know firsthand what we work with. I know the devices that we use. I know the different energy field patterns that we use. I know the different wave and silicon wave and harmonic configurations that we use on, on our spherical, coupled spherical devices and everything. I know the different solar systems we create and everything. I know it about dynamic equilibrium and balancing and everything. And it is not any holographic projection or holographic universe. And it is not a video game or, or the matrix or anything like that. It's very real. We use the images we use a, an impregnation of a standing field pattern on a sphere, then we send a singular soliton wave through it, a one- to three-dimensional soliton wave, and we project it to the target that we're working on, and it projects that soliton wave to the target. And when it expands, um, the, the, the differences between the soliton standing soliton wave field, which is usually a spherical field or an oblong field, and the system that, that is injected into that difference it's called a phase correction, and it corrects the standing other field it cor- within that system that we're working on, and everything stabilizes, and then we lock it in. And, uh, no, you're going to tell me that that's a matrix that a holograph didn't give you? That's bullshit. I, I didn't ever say seen, that. I didn't say that. Mo- whoever's I telling the mainstream scientists this, there's an evil negative ET scourge, and they're doing it on purpose to mislead mainstream scientists, to keep them running around in circles, and that way they can keep this human race dumbing down. This human race somehow by accident became a commodity and be, and became caught up in the game between the negative scourge and the positive ones that are trying to liberate the, and stabilize the universe. And they're all vying for this piece of real estate because this is a very critical strategic navigational route, and this is a very st- strategic point on what, what you call – the, the baseline harmonic resonance pattern that governs physical reality. And anybody who controls the earth controls the universe. And you, you can bet that the negative ET scourge that came over from the other universe that was collapsed, they, they, they were, they're vying for this because if they can control the Orion Stargate system, they, they, they've got it. And then everybody is at their mercy and we might as well kiss our butts goodbye. No, but I, I mean, yeah. I actually, I know, I know what you're saying, and I am yeah. not contradicting it at all. I'm just saying that that is not my field. Yeah, I think what, I'm actually good, aware good, of what but, you're saying, and I've, I, I, I'm aware of what you're saying, and also aware of the, you know, scientific aspects behind it. I know where the Orion gates are, but um, that's just not my field. That's all I'm saying. Well, I had to use scientific terms to describe what I'm doing. When I was younger and I went through all of this, I was going through my awakening process. There wasn't any support groups or talk groups or anything. And even if there was, it wouldn't do me any good. Yeah, I don't so I had to figure out all of this out on my own. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I think, I think you really like Lisa Renee. I think that's a really good person for you. Um and I, 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 you have a lot in common. Yeah, I think Suzanne. I'm trying to find things, her, and we're running out of time, and so we need to wrap this up. Um, All right, well, Janet, I could not I find Lisa you, Renee's contact information, but I did find her website, so I'm looking for that. But go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, you can go on. 
Well, this would yeah, be good, Johanna, if we can do this again. But what it is with our wise, wild women and wise women and wise quantum women, because Susanna uh, is, we don't have a title for her yet, folks, but we'll try to find one. But she's so, uh, with you here, Suzanne, I wanted you to meet Johanna. So I really appreciate you coming on the show at my request. And Janet said, no, she didn't mind. So this is good, because we're just getting this going, folks, for 2021. But uh, I think what Janet's sort of doing here is helping me put together a team of different psychic abilities, our women, at least with an open mind, that can figure out who we're supposed to connect with out there. And Johanna, I'm sure, like you had a, a name, I could even come up with a name for Susanna. So I really appreciate that. And, and you being open from the heart, because Sus uh, Suzanne, Johanna teaches transformation from the heart, uh, medical, or she was in C. She worked in television and in C. She worked with CBS and did some shows, discovery type shows. You might not have heard that because you went on the show earlier. But she's not only a psychic, but she uh, has done a lot of communications. And uh, for the record, folks, believe it or not, in space, universally, my job is communications, not warfare. Uh, although my husband was a warrior. So I can sort of get what Suzanne is talking about because he had that same warrior voice and uh, uh, feeling for the I'm human running race. running out of time. All right, well, let's uh, do um, this again. And you can invite us back maybe sometime if you'd like. Sure, certainly, yes, okay. Um, final word, Johanna, since you're our special guest today. How can people reach you? What's your website? Uh, my website is quantumheartfield.com, and that's the best way to reach me. It has all contact information on there. So it's quantum as in quantum physics, heart as the organ in your chest, and field as in baseball field. So quantumheartfield.com. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for coming on today. Thank you for putting up with this crazy people. <laughs> so yes, we really thank enjoyed you. Happy, hanging happy out with New you. Year to everybody. <laughs> yeah, happy this, New this Year. is the final show of the year for every, for um, Wise Wild Women, and we'll see you again in 2021. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Teresa. Aloha, love, and blessings. Aloha, thank love, you, and buddy. blessings. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Janet. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.